Welcome everyone. My name is Alma Nasachi. I'm Director of Market Access and Policy at Public Policy Projects and the lead for the Wound Care Programme. Public Policy Projects is an organisation operating at the heart of health and life science policy delivery. We are led by former Secretary of State for Health, the Right Honourable Stephen Durrell. This is the second of three roundtables in the public policy projects going further for the wound care programme. This programme sets out to tackle some of the most salient and timely questions in wound care for 2024. Our forum today is on levelling up the experience of wound care. There'll be a 15 minute discussion after each speaker, so please have your questions ready and use the chat box to share your thoughts and introduce yourself. The insights gathered today will form the basis of the recommendations for our insights report for this particular forum, which will be shared with you all within the coming months. The series will then continue with a further roundtable on the 30th of October and a large scale conference on the 2nd of December in London. And we will post the link for you to register for the conference in the chat. Before we start, I want to thank our chair, Emma Wright, and the speakers, Helen Shoker, Lauren Thorpe, Naz Ahmed, and Anne Smith, who's going to be sharing her experience of, of utilising the wound care services. And our sponsors of the roundtable, Monica, who without we could not have had this, this roundtable, this forum. So just some house rules before we start. Please don't mention any particular products by name. Um, we are running this um, and recording it for our YouTube channel. Please remain on mute unless you are speaking and raise your hand if you want to ask a question, keep your cameras on and introduce yourself through the chat box. I hope you find the discussion stimulating and thought provoking and I'll now hand over to Emma. Thank you, Amina. And I'd just like to add my welcome um, to this evening's event um, to really talk about a topic close to my heart and close to all the speakers that you're going to hear from today in terms of wound care in the UK. Um, so as I'm going to have said, my name is Emma Wright. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Moonlicker Healthcare. Um, and I just really want to set the scene for a couple of minutes before handing over to our speakers. So chronic wound healing rates remain very poor, not just in the UK, but actually across the globe. And we've seen really limited improvements despite major technological advances, such as silicone wound dressings, negative pressure wound therapy, and topical oxygen therapy. So we have to ask the question, why are we not seeing improvements in healing rates for wounds? And the answer is very complex and it's multifactorial. Firstly, wound care is not a medical specialty. It therefore lacks ownership, it doesn't have a place to call its home, and that can create many challenges when trying to get attention to this much needed area of clinical care. Secondly, wounds are often associated with a very vulnerable pa patient population. But I would say this is not actually correct. We're starting to see more and more wounds in younger patients. And we also have to remember when we talk about wounds, we're talking about acute as well as chronic wounds. And while acute wounds may have better healing rates, they still have issues like infection, which can have a huge impact on their ability to heal. But I do think much of the issue in wound care lies in the lack of joined up thinking. I tend to see wound care as a giant dot to dot figure where the dots are on the page and they're all in the right place, but no one's joined the lines up between them. And I really think that is where we need to get very much more involved in partnership. Partnership between the physician, the patient, the healthcare system and the med tech industry in order to provide a better continuum of care. We're really very much from an industry perspective in an era where med tech has met health tech. Health tech being that digital technology that's coming to the forefront of healthcare and will truly revolutionize how we provide care, not just to wound patients, but beyond. The digital era will allow for greater dissemination of wound care expertise, standardization of approaches, which is much needed, greater coordination of care, including data collection, so we make better data and evidence-driven decisions, and drive greater patient engagement. All of this will help tackle the greatest issues we have post-pandemic, which is really the availability of clinical resources, improving workflow efficiency and removing as many activities that do not require clinical expertise from clinicians is key. We need to allow doctors to be doctors and nurses to be nurses. WUNCA is very much an active area of research. New clinical data is continually published 
There are new guidelines released on a regular basis. But we're failing to drive adoption of these findings into our standard of care practices. We need to be able to implement the latest research into everyday practice. But how does a busy clinician then find the time to stay abreast of the latest knowledge? This is compounded by the turnover of clinical staff, the use of temporary bank staff who may not be fully aware of facilities or clinics, working processes and procedures. It means that although there's often a clear care pathway in wound care, or certainly in some areas of wound care, that we don't always follow that in terms of the patient journey. The patient journey often deviates from that known care pathway. And with each deviation, it can result in harm, potential harm, waste and variation. And then lastly, let's not forget what's at the heart of wound care, the patient. You're going to hear today about how it is to live with a wound. And the reality is that more wounds are managed over long periods of time than are ever healed. No one should ever have to live with a wound. So with that, it's a great opportunity for me to introduce Anne Smith, who has very kindly and bravely agreed to speak to you all today about what it is to be a wound care patient and live with a wound. Thank you and over to you, Anne. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anne. I'm, um, I've had wounds probably for the last six years. I um, started, yeah, six years ago with a diabetic leg ulcer. Um, the care that I received was long and drawn out, trying to access the proper um, dressings, etc., that that were needed. And it was always going to the doctor's to get a nurse appointment you wouldn't necessarily see the same people so nobody really knew what your wound looked like except for for, for myself um so they seem to take an awful long time um the last two experiences that i've had though have been completely different they've um organized what by a charity called leg club where everybody with chronic wounds can go go every week you see the same people you have access to all the other um departments that you possibly might need what when you have a wound so if you've you need a scan or you need to go and see somebody else they can help you with that so actually in my my experience the last two times that i've had them they've healed so much quicker because I've had the constant care of the same people. And I think that's really important when it comes to wound care, that you have people that you can rely on and you don't have to wait for the next available appointment for a nurse in the surgery or a doctor in the surgery. So that's really my journey. It's very difficult to live with a wound if you're not supported as much as you need to be because obviously sometimes when the wounds are really bad then you'll need extra care you'll need like to go to the doctors and, and get your dressings changed and things like that so the leg club has really helped stop having to wait so you're you've got treatment really really quickly and I think that's key that's definitely been key to my my recovery I think that's about <laughs> all I can say. Thank you, Anne. And I think we very much appreciate what you have to say. Um, we know for many, many patients how difficult it is to live with these chronic wounds. And so we'd like to encourage some discussion and this be very much a, a participative forum. So if you have any questions, um, I'm not sure I can see you, but feel free to speak up or raise your hand. Um, I'll put it into the chat and I'll also open that to our other speakers as well if they have any questions for Anne. So and maybe I'll start by asking you, um, the leg club, how did you find it in terms of being able to meet other people that also had chronic wounds and had shared similar experiences as yourself? Um, I was offered leg club the, the the second to last time that I had a wound I, I managed to get to the 
the nurse and she said have you heard about leg club and I said no because I think it had come into uh it started just as I'd finished my last I'd managed to heal the ulcer so she said I'll pop along and it's it's really good because there's a lot of people that go a lot obviously older people than myself and I, I think it's like the, the support network that they get for each other as well it's really important and there's um like a podiatrist that can come so they can you can go there and you can get all your bits done rather than having to go different places um so that's really good and the support that you get from the other people about their experiences and how they're um treating their wounds and things because you're right sometimes these things take an awful long time Helen thank you Th thank you Anne I, I, I'm going to ask you an impossible question so um, forgive me for it but if you could name one or two things that had the biggest impact on you as a person whilst you were living with um, your lower limb wounds, what, what would those things be? Oh, definitely um, not being able to go out with your family, do do things that you love. Like I really love walking, but that's not when it's, especially if it's infected, etc. And it's so painful. It's very difficult to um, keep up that sort of thing. I love walking. Um, and it's also things like, like self-care, when you've got a um a, a wound, etc., you know, even going in the shower and things, you know, you have to wear these plastic boots and things like that. So it's it's really impactful. Um and I still work. Um, so you know, when it's really, really bad and I can't walk, then I have to have some time off work and you know, and that can that can be sort of detrimental to your, your working life as well. So it is it is difficult. Yeah. So you're sort of quite it's quite isolating to have like a chronic wound that's not healing or whatever you yeah you do stop yourself doing things like swimming etc anything that other than reading like all the things that I like are to do with like walking swimming that sort of thing but obviously that that's not I'm not able to do that when I have a wound so and also you have to be really really careful when you're with your skin etc so yeah it's very impactful for your for, for every every bit in your life really and I think that leads very nicely to, to a question we've received from Innes which was what was the most important thing in relation to psychological support that you received either from the leg club or any other service providers that you had during your experience I with think them? Um, definitely, especially like with Leg Club, they're all very supportive and the, the group of nurses are all all the same. So you might not see exactly the same nurse, but it's the, um, the sort of the, the amount of nurses that you do. So you might have not heard, seen one nurse for a couple of weeks and they'll come over and say, oh, right, that looks really good. Or, oh, right, that maybe we need to look at this. And so, yeah, it's just it's just having that support, really. And people know know what they're doing and I'm not it's not disrespectful to any but but as you say like wound care is not necessarily a a sort of like thing that you always come across whereas if we're all there with leg wounds um yeah the support is amazing and I think that leads us to a, a question that I'm going to pose to the audience for a bit of discussion really which is from a system perspective what do we see as the most critical factors contributing to inequalities in wound care access and outcomes, just as you've heard and described prior to a finding the, the answer to some of that within the leg club? So if anyone would like to make any comments on that, please do. If you'd rather just put it in the chat, I can also read out any comments that you may have, or if any of our speakers would like to, to comment on that, because that's a huge issue is the inequality of care that we see in wounds. I, I attend the one in uh, Basingstoke, the yeah, club in Basingstoke. Naz? Yeah, I mean, the whole issue of uh, inequality, I'll be chatting about later on in my in, in my presentation. But I think one of the really important things that, uh, that Anne mentioned is the whole idea of psychological support. Uh, it's a massive um, 
drive for the service to give patients that support to help them with what they need. And sometimes, you know, as, as clinicians, we, we sometimes forget just having a, a kind word, just spending time with people makes a massive difference. And many of us will have been on the receiving end of care. And we sometimes, you know, once you see it, you know what it's like. And sometimes if you haven't been on the other at, at the other end, you don't really understand what it's like. So I think psychological support is really important. And the uh, I said the inequality, I'll, I'll speak about some of those uh, um, shortly. And we have received a question about the Lindsay Leg Club. Um, they are all over the country. In fact, they're actually even international. Um, but the majority of them are established in the UK. I'm sure we can ask um, someone from the forum just to put the website in the chat for anyone interested. It is a, it's a great initiative. Um, and when you actually look at the data behind them, they have very compelling healing rates that really speaks to the benefit of Patients helping patients in many ways. I'm just reading the questions. Yeah, there's the website in the chat for anyone who's interested. Uh, so the questions are coming thick and fast and moving quickly in front of me. So, um, Nick Hex has commented, it shows the value of joined up care from the perspective of Anne, but there's also a good argument for the more efficient delivery care if Anne can see multiple professionals rather than having to have lots of different appointments. And I think we really know the value of the MDT approach. And I don't know, Helen, if you'd like maybe like to speak a little bit more about the MDT approach for wound care. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really good point. And um, across NHS England, there is a, a huge agenda around personalisation of care rather than us all going in and individually doing what we want, actually sitting from the, the person's perspective and um, trying to build the care around them. Um, if I carry on, I'll start going into my bits. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't well, you know can, if, you can if hold the us conversation there with is finished at this mind. point, but um, I, I think based on some of the other the other questions and comments being made, then um, for, for me and my experience working in wound care, it's about the profile and it being seen at a level where system change can be um, delivered. And often it's that's not the case. It's at little pockets, often at... Um, a nursing or a, an interested um, consultant or physician's perspective um, and trying to raise the profile is, is one of the biggest challenges but also um, as you'll hear from colleagues this evening it's one of the areas where you can have the biggest impact because I'm sure if that profile hadn't been there in Manchester um, and hadn't had people who were really passionate about the subject area, they wouldn't have been able to achieve, which is similar to what has um, happened with Lauren and I in Coventry. And I think, again, not to steal the thunder of what you're going to speak about, but I think there's, there's a comment here um, around the disconnect between acute care and community care um, and the challenges that that brings, particularly in the wound care space where patients with chronic wounds get recurrences, they can turn up at very many different locations within their healthcare system. Um, and so I don't know if you'd like to comment a little bit or on NAS as well, if you'd like to comment from the acute side and Helen maybe from the community side. So I would say, and this is just my professional opinion, is um, silo working and um, people being comfortable to work in their silos and possibly believing that they know the best and don't need to share with others. So you end up um, with, with people with lower limb wounds and, and any wound etiology actually, bouncing from a specialist tissue viability service to a surgical specialty, to their practice nurse, uh, to community nursing, as opposed to actually having a pathway that follows the patient irrespective of where they are and who's involved. Uh, I, I would completely echo that. The, the problem is we just don't talk to each other. I mean, we have a, we have the solution with integrated care teams because the word is integrated and we're not. And that's all you got to do. 
sounds simple. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure as we go through the rest of this evening, we'll realise that is very much a theme that you'll hear from all the speakers about the need for integrated care, but the challenges that comes with that. Okay, I'm just looking at the rest of the questions. Lindsay, Lindsay Clayton, I've got a note here that you have some uh, comments you'd like to make. I don't know if I'll speak, if, if the audience can actually come off mute and speak. No, okay. And also, if you'd just like to have any uh, reaction rather than comment, there is a react bottom at, button at the bottom of the Zoom screen as well. So if you'd like to add your support to any comments or challenge them, then please feel free to use that react button. And if you do have something to say, um, just let us know in the chat and we will on mic on unmute you so you can use your mic and we can put your camera on if you wish. Lauren, have you got something you would like to add around the inequality of care in the UK for wounds? I think seeing some of the comments coming through, Emma, it sort of resonates with me being at clinician level, seeing the frustrations coming through and the way people are worded in their comments is um, it, it's reassuring in a way to know that we do suffer the same um, inequalities, but not so reassuring because together we can come over some of these challenges. I think something that um, somebody's just made quite a valid point around is um, accessing different services, creating the inequalities. Uh, for example, patient in different boroughs cannot access the same services. And I think as clinicians, we find that as a frustration because we know that our colleagues down the road can access quite a number of channels that we can't. Um, I think one of the national things we see is the, the inequalities across lymphedema care. It, it completely feeds into some of the issues that we're seeing on the ground. Absolutely. And do you, how do you see a change in that? Who do you think needs to come together to drive change in that, particularly around that commissioning piece? I think that's a little bit above my head, to be honest, Emma. I think every one of us has got a part to play. I think in every forum we can be in, every case we can highlight um, and asking patients to also be their own advocates, which is exhausting as well. But yeah. I think there is a role for everybody to be able to highlight the inequalities and not make it the norm. I think that sometimes is where we do fall short as clinicians is to accept that there is inequalities and carry on. It's when we do speak out around it. And I think that, you know, there's been a comment here about the lack of specialised staff. And I think that's a very valid one and how that varies greatly across the country. Um, and really, how are we going to overcome that? I think, you know, I, I can comment a little bit on that um, from, the, from the technology side. I think patients are becoming much more engaged in their care. Even if it's not the patient themselves, it may be their caregiver. We're seeing much more use of healthcare assistance in the wound care world. And we do have an issue with really getting that knowledge, even the basic knowledge on how to cleanse a wound or uh, prepare a wound bed to a greater population of people who are delivering that care. And I think that's where really, as we're entering into this era of digitalization, there's some real opportunities, um, but it's a balancing act. You know, how do we balance the, the ability to further disseminate the information with the expertise on how to utilize that information? So I don't know if anyone, any of our speakers would like to comment on that. I think I could probably just intervene a little bit with that one, Emma. I think there's also the absence of services and trust to accept that they have that need as well. And to embrace the digital change is quite, is quite a tough challenge, I'd say. Um, having experienced some of this ourselves over the past number of years, there's amazing technology out there. There's amazing information, but trying to get the red tape um, get through that red tape with what we should yeah. be doing with it is the challenge I think we've found. So we've got a couple of raised hands. Uh, Deborah Donaldson, I think you're a patient if you'd like to unmute.
Deborah, you've been unmuted. If not, we've got Maria Poole from the Leg Club. We can come back to Deborah if you can, if you if you're ready. Maybe if we can unmute Maria. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's good. Um, I've been trying to interject a lot this after, this evening, and I just couldn't get it. I couldn't get it going, and I don't know why I can't turn my camera on either. There is an issue. I'm not hiding, honestly. <laughs> um, those of you that know me will know I'm not shy. <laughs> Um, and it really, really was just to, to agree with an awful a lot of what's been said. I think, Lauren, you did yourself an injustice in saying that, you, you know, when you were asked about how you can influence commissioners and things, because I think you answered that really well in terms of, you know, every clinician has the responsibility to try and speak up and not just get stuck in that every day. This is what we do. We've got this many patients to get through and stop and think, what can we do to deliver it differently? Um, because as being said, it's very clear that, you know, there are areas like the leg clubs and that's what I was interested in and to know where you're going. I'll hopefully be seeing you very soon in Basingstoke. Well, no, hopefully you won't be there. But hopefully if you're not. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, I think it's about sometimes stepping back and realising that th things can be done differently and how do we approach that and how do we actually make that change? And that that is a real, real challenge. And I think that's what leads then to the um, differences, the equality, inequalities in what's delivered and um, to Helen's point about people working in silos. So it's, I think if we could just come up with something and having now, you know, being a tissue viability nurse myself, worked in industry for years um, in a clinical role and now as a clinical consultant for the leg club, you know, I've seen it from every angle. And I think if we could just come up with some kind of method or mode to assist that change and assist that different outlook and perhaps encourage people to get off the hamster wheel and stop and think, what do we need to do differently? I've seen the work the girls in Coventry have done and it's absolutely brilliant. You go to those clinics and it's a, a breath of fresh air because the approach is completely different. And it, I think things like this are a great forum to share, but it's how do we actually really embrace that change and make that real difference? Um, it's more of a, com a, com a comment really than a solution, but yeah, that's my thoughts. Thank you, Marie. And I think that's a, that's a great segue into Helen and Lauren, who are going to speak about the need and their approaches to standardization within wound care. So if you'd both like to uh, just introduce yourselves first. So um, good evening. It's it's lovely to see a lot of names that I recognise. And um, so lovely to see you all. Um, I'm Helen Shoker. I'm the lead nurse for Wound Care Pathways. And I work across the community group in Coventry, the University Hospitals Coventry in Warwickshire, primary mm -hmm. care, social care and the voluntary sector. Um, it's a really interesting role. And Lauren and I first started work, working together four years ago. And um, I think it's fair to say that we, um, between us, have recognised that um, across the city of Carpentry, inequality takes many forms. Um, and what we'd like to share with you today is just one example of what we're doing to, um, to um, decrease that inequality. And the project that we're going to share to you is about um, inequality of access um, to the right services for people at the right time. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the getting it right first time approach to healthcare. Those are the principles that we um, have adopted. Um, so Lauren's going to talk to you a little bit about what we have done clinically. But what I want to do is just set the scene, because I think as clinicians, if we aren't engaged in the community and the population that we serve and we don't understand the challenges of that population, then how can we um, advocate for um, the people that live there and how can we design and deliver our services and in the absence of that we will just continue to put our heads down running cl running clinics um, and but not offering what is needed for for the people that actually live in our communities so coventry is the ninth largest city in england and the 12th in the uk it's deemed to have a young population but the prediction over the next 10 years is that the age group of 65 plus will grow at a faster rate than the average of all ages. 
44% of our population identify as being part of an ethnic minority group. And that's higher than the West Midlands region and England, which stands at 26.5%. Coventry is also a welcoming city and has been an, is, uh, uh, oh, I can't say these words, as the council would describe it, an asylum dispersal city. In other words, a city of sanctuary. And in that respect, we've got a large migrant population. And that in itself brings health inequalities and is a key priority for the city council, the health sector and um, voluntary services. Deprivation in our city stands at 75.6% of the neighbourhoods, which are amongst the 20% of the most deprived areas. Deprivation in itself is a known challenge for health system for the health system and tackling these inequalities. And unfortunately for the residents of Coventry, life expectancy is low, lower than the regional and national average, at around 10% um, for men and about 8% for women. Like many areas, our local economy has slowed and is below that again for the region and, and um, across England. And the cost of living crisis set amongst these demographics of our population has had a particular risk to the health and well-being for those that are disabled, those that live with long-term conditions, many of which will um, um, develop wounds associated with the long-term condition of heart disease, diabetes and vascular conditions. So now I'm going to pass over to Lauren, um, having set the scene of the city that we actually work within and how we're beginning to reduce those inequalities. This is just one example of what we're doing. Um, and our um, priority is to improve health and well-being across all of the providers of health and well-being. Thank you, Lauren. Hello, thank you, Helen. Um, so Helen introduced around um, Coventry area. I've worked in Coventry for, I think, around 13 years now, and the the system hasn't really changed in all that time. Um, and I think we can only say that what we are seeing is a lot more patients living with wounds um, in all age groups absolutely is Tallinn. Um, and, but what we are seeing is that the demographics is changing in the healthcare and the workforce. So working from a community nursing perspective, nationally, we are losing a lot of our experienced staff within a community. And I think that's something that within Coventry, uh, we felt really strongly about how can we help support the, the struggling workforce out there. So within Coventry, we um, we worked on a model around two years ago um, where nobody asked us to do this. Sorry, um, I will say uh, we just sort of thought we'd do something and then apologise after, I think was our kind of, um, we knew we were going into it with the right head. So apologies now if we are gonna get in trouble for some of the work we've done. <laughs> um, so what we did was we looked at our staffing and workforce across our team. So at the time we, um, we were only able to cater for patients that were ambulatory and able to attend a clinic setting. So that cohort of patients were able to get a gold standard of care within the clinic setting. And what we felt was that there was quite a health inequality. We had um, a workforce in the community that wasn't as sustainable as what we would like. There was quite small numbers. And um, within that, there wasn't much variety in skill mix. So it didn't give us the best opportunity to be able to follow through on patient's care. So around two years ago, we designed a model where we wanted to invest in more of our um, staffing, not just within the clinics. We wanted to create an equity out in patients in their own homes. So if you were living at home with a lower limb ulcer or a non-healing wound at the time, your care would be done under the care of community nurses. We designed a workforce where we were able to support and bolster that within the community. So if a patient was identified with a non-healing wound, we wouldn't just go in and deliver a, um, a care plan for the community nurses to follow. We staffed our service to be able to take on patients for caseload management. So if you had a non-healing um, lower limb wound or a non-healing pressure ulcer, rather than seeing a tissue viability service as a one-off assessment or maybe a re-review in a couple of weeks, we took over the care of um, these patients to be able to understand if they had the potential for healing, if they um, were able to um, support it to live well with their wounds or if they needed ongoing specialist referral. 
So it helped us to identify what patients are out there. In the absence of any digital system giving us the data, we had to cast our eyes on a lot of these patients to be able to understand the complexities. And um, it was a model that we felt very strongly about in the early days. It was a concept that we tested. And now two years into this experience, we've got a rapidly growing team out in the community um, of around 10 clinicians now of a variety of skill mix. And um, so we have healthcare assistants, registered nurses, nurse associates, um, and everybody absolutely knows them caseload patients. So a patient comes on to our caseload, we're able to identify what their goals for healing are um, and understand with the patients about what their goals are, not just what the clinician goals are. And some of the benefits of what we do for these patients up to 12 weeks, we give that continuity. So what Anne spoken about earlier on was sometimes the continuity does suffer. And as a patient, that's really disheartening when you see a different clinician at the door every time, because we are a, a small team that caseload manage, we are able to provide continuity of care. And in turn, we found that patient trust has, has absolutely gone up tenfold. Patients are absolutely able to rely on our clinicians in the team with their knowledge and be able to explain what they want to do with their wounds and help them heal or support them to live as best as they can with their wounds. So we... Um, we, we designed it and now it's live two years in. Um, around 200 patients have... Um, in receipt of this caseload management um, and some of the patients that we've seen have, have had their wounds for um, a number of years a patient the other day uh, gave such amazing feedback he's had his wound over a year and he, we can see him healing within the next four weeks um, just from the difference of the caseload management and the intense caseload support that we provide to these patients fantastic and what great success you, you've had with this initiative i'm sure there are Many questions or comments that uh, some of our audience might let might like to make. So feel free to raise your hand, and we will unmic you. So if I can, I can just add there was a piece of work that we uh, Lauren and I um, did prior to this, where we looked at the whole caseload across the city. Um, and we looked at every environment where people were being nursed with wounds and so the work to set up the service that that we run um, is whilst it's seen as a specialist service actually it's just about um, stratifying patient need so rather than everybody going in to see every patient at every time the patients that um, Lauren and her team see that are um, absolutely housebound that would have had no access to wound care otherwise are the most complex. Um, and at the same time, we've been supporting general community nurses and practice nurses um, to be able to care for the right, um, that's not the right way to say it, but the, the appropriate level of complexity of person. Um, we've also embedded um, social prescribing and access to clinical psychology within the team. Um, and as Lauren described, every patient that we see, um, every person that we see, is we have a, a really robust conversation with them about what is it that they want to achieve. As clinicians, we might see that healing is possible, but actually if the person is um, has got a number of challenges in their social life, um, or their working environment, it might be just keep trying, help me to keep free of infection, help me to manage the exudate levels. I'm just not at the point at this moment in time to heal. Um, and we'll carry on that conversation. And if they feel ready, then we'll move it over. But that, that, that's, that collective decision-making rather than chasing healing all the time that isn't always practical. And also on the um, opposite is recognizing that for some people, their long-term condition can't be fixed. Mm. And it's helping them to change mindsets to this will reoccur. And when it does, these are the things that, that we can work together on doing. And um, for some of our patients with you know, significant arterial disease, for example, or um, malignant wounds, um, again, it's that what's important to you at this point in time, because we know that, um, you know, an arterial, um, a lower limb wound that's arterial in base with no surgical intervention, then at, at some point we're talking about end of life care. So it's about making sure that the wound care is, is appropriate to that 
which um, again is probably different to some experiences um, of other places where it's it's almost the chase to heal um, mm -hmm. when that's not that's not actually either realistic or what the person wants. So you're, you're very much taking a personalised medicine, if not a, a personalised care approach to your to your patients. Yeah, and we and we measure the outcomes of every person based on what the person and, and ourselves actually have come up with in agreements. Um, you know, and it and it is a mutual debate around that. You know, we have, um, you know, I've just set the scene of of the kind of um, challenges that we have across our city, and we do have um, groups of people that you know make unwise lifestyle decisions, shall we say? Um, you know, and it's it's carrying on that um that debate with them as individuals and you know putting in a bit of challenge around the things that are important to them and how we can help um with those ways um we're really fortunate we work with a, a great multidisciplinary team across the city uh, but there's still much much work to be done but we're at that exciting point where we set in motion something that because we could set it in motion and we've apologized since <laughs> Um, but that has provided us with a really robust starting position that people actually respect what we're trying to do in terms of population health management um, and uh, the personalisation mm -hmm. agenda, which means that the conversations we've had over the two years and are having now are quite well received because we've already demonstrated that we can, we can do um, work like this. And, and maybe you can comment a little bit on the, the patient education piece. So take this very personalised approach. How do you tailor the education and what tools do you have available to you? Because as you've talked about, these wounds are often recurrent. Um, so you're always trying to in, improve the situation for the next one. Maybe you can speak a little bit about how you handle that with a diverse range of patients. Want me to step in with that one, Helen? And in terms of the caseloads that we see, because we do go in and offer that continuity, we can tailor it and shape it to the individual. So rather than a tailored program of X number of weeks you're providing this, it's very much about it, what activation has that patient got at that point in time. Um, so the first off that we find is, um, from an experience perspective, is the patients um, come to us with a level of frustration. And their frustration about navigating the systems and the services and that being bounced from um, specialist to specialism. So one of our first goals with the patient is to be able to de-escalate some of that and gain that trust. And that's I'd say that's quite a common piece that we see across the city. And just understanding and establishing where that patient's at on that journey is really helpful. Um, and in turn, what we have managed to do is um, factor back into community nursing a lot of um, nursing hours. Um, that actually the dwindling work workforce um, wasn't able to meet. So although from a speciality perspective, um, we, we take over the care of this, the care is then continued in the community nursing under a right pathway of care for that patient. So the ongoing learning is also then embedded into the community nursing team. It, it's not where we would like yet. It, there's a lot more work that can be done in that aspect, but this is all concept and concept and change doesn't happen straight away, does it? Absolutely. And it seems like you're having a lot of success with this approach. So what are you doing to try and get the message out there that this works and, and encourage areas to, to get involved in this multidisciplinary personalised approach to wound care? I think coming um, being asked to talk on something like this was quite key for us to be able to start the discussions around, OK, we're two years in, we've tested the concept, we've got a number of patient examples and stories, we've got two years worth of data around how the team have um, produced these healing outcomes. And it's now actually how, if there are people out there who would like to learn from this and understand and shape their own services, it, this hasn't come from waiting for somebody in NHS England to tell us what to do this is just local work that we've embedded on and thought we've got a concept let's run with it and a lot of the time I think as nurses going into something with the best intention sometimes is a, taking a leap of faith isn't it great thank you very much I don't know if we've got any hands raised we do want to publish some of this work later on in the next year as well but i think many people trying to find the time interested. yeah i think many people <laughs> be interested to hear more
it hasn't it come is. without its challenges though you know having a team of a workforce and clinicians there you always get the normal challenges but the team are just they're fully embraced and understood on where the vision is with this and the concept and they get such job satisfaction fantastic thank you helen and lauren so i think now we're going to pivot the conversation slightly um, and speak to Naz, more about the systems perspective when it comes to wound care. So Naz, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. I, I'm Naz, uh, Nasir Ahmad, a vascular surgeon based up in Manchester. I'm also the clinical director for the MARS programme, the Manchester Amputation Reduction Strategy. And I guess our two sort of headline figures are that over the last uh, six years, between 2015, 16 and 21, 22, we reduced lower limb amputations by the prevalence by 46% within those six years. The numbers went down by 42% and the prevalence went down by 46%. And that was in one locality within Greater Manchester, which had a, a sort of a population of 220,000. We're now scaling that work up to just over a million people. And we managed to do that within existing resource. We didn't employ a single extra podiatrist or a single extra nurse. We've saved over £200,000 per year in hospital costs alone. And um, we did it, um, you know, as, as I was mentioned before, you know, you, you, you kind of, um, you know, uh, you, you, the aim is to seek forgiveness, not permission. Um, that's the sort of principle uh, that we applied. And the, the, the most important thing, I guess, around all this is uh, time to first expert assessment. Uh, the patient needs to be at the right place at the right time as soon as uh, it, is, it is within that uh, patient uh, journey. One of the things that we addressed is a language of change and how did we get the system to do it? And when people try to convince us this and they always go with the clinical argument that this is the right thing to do. And all I can say is the clinical argument is always one because they know that we're the experts. That's not the argument that, that needs to be used. And if you look at the NHS, various NHS reports and the Greater Manchester reports and the Lord Darcy reports, there are certain themes that the NHS wants to do. And the question is always, of the project that you want to do, how does it speak to those system aims? And those system aims are basically, you know, analog to digital, hospital community, cure to prevention, debt to durability, stress to steadfastness, silos to whole systems, unfairness to equality and black to green. I, by that, I mean the, the sort of uh, the, the green agenda. And so the question for the system is how do we increase capacity within existing resource, you know, reduce stress on staff, be more fair, be green, be fiscally responsible, whilst reducing demand and taking advantage of technology? That's the question your project needs to answer. And that's what we did with Mars. We worked across the entire system. Uh, so we worked across public health, community, hospital, with procurement, academia, digital, with the underpinning of culture to try and get people to know each other and talk to each other. We designed 25 new pathways that everybody worked towards, and we, and we made sure that the teams, at the, you know, band fours, five, six, seven, and eights, they were always working right at the top of their band. So they got that sort of satisfaction of what they, of what they do. We also reduced significant uh, duplication within the system as well. The key language, as well as those themes, was inequality. People don't really understand wounds. So for us, the clinical answer was amputations because people understand that. And the inequality within wounds is twofold. Right? If you're diabetic with a foot wound, you go to a diabetic foot team and you get all the care that diabetic foot ulcers need. You know, you get your infection, the offloading, the vascular supply, get all that sorted. But if you've got a foot ulcer and you're not diabetic, you don't get access to those services. And that's an inequality, that's an unfairness in the system. That multidisciplinary approach, approach has been shown to improve care for diabetic foot ulcers. So why can't non-diabetic foot ulcers go to those same services? We then went a step further, further and said, listen, why don't we do the same for all lower limb ulcers, for leg ulcers, the lymphedema, leaky legs, all that kind of stuff. They need multidisciplinary care. They need the vascular surgeon. They need the diapathologist. They need the microbiologist. They need the orthopedic surgeon. They need the orthotist. They need the same services. So the question is, how do we level up care to the diabetes standard 
without compromising diabetes? And that's the question that we asked. And we did that. And the question is, how do we increase capacity within existing resource? Well, there's only four things you can do. You co-design change. You stop doing some stuff. You do more appropriate stuff and you build network. There's only four things that you can do. So we did all those things and I don't want to go into the detail of, of, all, of all that. It takes a long time. I noted that something in the question around education. Can I just say education, education, education is not the answer. People know what to do. The problem is not that people don't know. We've got guidelines, we've got nice guidelines, we've got international guidelines. There's plenty of guidelines. The problem is implementation and understanding why people are not implementing that change. And if you go with the idea of, listen, how do I allow you to do your job properly? How do I remove all the faff? How do I take your job from stress to steadfastness? We all un understand pressure and we work okay with pressure, you know, that's what it is. But it's the stress that destroys you. So how can we as a system reduce stress in people? But sometimes it's something really simple, right? You know, you go, you try to turn your computer on, why does your computer not start within 10 seconds? My computer, 10 seconds is ready to go. If you're waiting a minute for your computer to start, how frustrating is that? Or oh, you're changing between systems. So it's about understanding the challenges uh, and the problems that people have that cause them stress, removing that stress, and then working with teams to change the culture. And so if you have that whole systems approach and the language of inequality, do the change. We then went to our, our ICS with those things. And listen, we've done this work. Can we put it onto your agenda for the next five years? And they did because it, it spoke to their themes. So the wound care became a flagship pr a project that spoke to system change. And, and so the question becomes, um, how do we scale up change as opposed to how do we do it? The NHS is great in pilot projects. What is bad at is scaling of change. And at the heart of it is sustainability and scalability. So every project has to have those themes. Uh, so if you have those themes and you think about the wider picture, not just concentrate on a clinical argument, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the key for getting the system to work for this particular group of patients. Thanks. Thank you, Naz. So again, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. And maybe while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Naz, how do you think you can, you've obviously been extremely successful, but how do you take that beyond your region and, and try and get that more implemented at a national level? So there's two things. So first of all, we are working with different ICSs across the country uh, and, and working with various transformation teams and execs who understand how we do it. The, the question with Mars is, uh, Mars is great in Manchester and in a particular area, but Mars, the principles of Mars apply everywhere. How it actually looks on the ground varies from place to place. We've got to understand the local context, the local services, the, lo the local setup, and then it's about applying that locally. Um, um, the, the key thing is our, our team is, uh, team now we've done it quite a few times with multiple teams going in, building those teams, building collaborative leadership. So you do, uh, you work with the team to you know improve pathways and all that kind of stuff. And then you got to, leave something with the team you've got to build the leadership within the teams there to be able to take things forward because you know you know today it's wound care tomorrow it'll be something else right so you've got to have that that that, 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 that uh, culture within the team so in terms of scaling it up it's about understanding the reasons why it's not being scaled up and why is it not working across teams and that takes detailed work on the ground uh, detailed planning to understand the barriers to implementation let me give you one quick example right so how, why is it that community nurses can't do a vascular assessment and then put somebody into compression? Compression is a simple, you know, we know it works, right? So just a simple thing, you do a vascular assessment and then if that's fine, go and, you know, um, uh, put compression on, right? They did ABPIs, but often ABPIs are too painful. So why didn't you just do a toe pressure? Well, we don't have the machine, we don't have the capability, we, we don't know what to do with the pathway. So my role became to make sure that we've got some uh, toe, toe pressure machines. We then got the edu education, but more importantly, what's stopping you from doing it? And what nurses always say is, well, if I get it wrong, it's my pin on the line. All right. If I get it wrong, nobody's going to support me. As a surgeon or as a doctor, you're kind of all right because you know, you're, you're used to that. As a nurse, I'm in the commuter. I'm on my own. So the role of me in that particular scenario 
was to provide confidence to the system that I've got your back. So it's that kind of stuff that you have to address to be able to implement uh, implement change. So I forgot what the original question was, but I hope that answered it. No, absolutely. The question was about how do we get a more national approach to the success yeah. you've had with Mars. So yeah, so I think so I think forums like this are important, and you know the, the paper that we've published recently, and you know you just got to raise awareness that it is possible to do, and work at a whole systems approach. I think what's different with us is uh, we're applying implementation science. There are principles of change management that you have to apply scientifically. And I think that if we, so we don't think of Mars as a vascular project or as a clinical project, it's a change management project, which is related to amputation reductions and system change. And I think that that sort of mental change moving from a clinical project to a change management is where the, the real difference is. And I think there's a, a comment here that's very relevant as well. So Sarah just speaks about the fact that we often work in silos and isolation. Um, and that seems to be a big thing that you've managed to overcome with Mars, getting everyone to work together. People often forget one of the one of the best um, you know, uh, innovations in getting people to talk is cake. People forget the, the value of cake you know cup of tea lemon slice it's great just to sit down and get to know each other that's what we don't do we just don't talk to each other and it's, it's not rocket science there's nothing new about this it's just talking to each other get to know you get to know your vascular surgeon get to know your diabetologist get to know your orthopedic surgeon some of us aren't particularly helpful and nice i get that but many of us are and you got to break down those barriers. I know, and you know, uh, uh, and to get to know how the system thinks, how particular people think, and just get to know each other. You know, I spent a lot of time speaking to. You know, I had to learn. I mean, I'm, I'm married to a nurse, right? So I, 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 I can speak vascular surgeon. I can, I can now speak nurse. Not very well. Must be the amount of time they get told off. I had to learn to speak commissioner language. I had to learn to speak procurement. I had to learn to speak. IT, I had to learn to speak a whole different language to people. And it's and, and it's understanding what is what are other people's tick boxes that I need to do for them to be able to do. Because you know, very often the people who you think is in charge actually they've got very little power. And we mm -hmm. often forget that. Um, but they've also got boxes to to tick. So I had to spend, you know, you got to do your homework, you got to read low the reports, get to know people and say, listen, what's important for you? I mean, how does my project, how do I tailor my project to work for you. And that's what we did in a right at the beginning of design. I spoke to the commissioner, spoke to Pan and said, what does this project need to do for you? And then once you answer, answer those, then you start taking it forward. So we've got a, a comment here that we all need a NAS. I think we'd all agree with that. <laughs> Hello, I'm not sure Lizzie would agree with that, but so yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to say thank you because uh, the things that you've just said really eloquently are all of the things that we we should be doing um, and certainly those are some of the approaches that we're taking in Coventry. I think um, I've worked in and around tissue viability and wound care for quite a number of years and some of my experiences is that, that people have deliberately uh, worked in silos because it's comfortable for them professionally and personally to stay in that silo. Um, and actually that that can be a real challenge to overcome in terms of um, stop doing what you've done for the last 10 years every single day. You've not genuinely innovated. You've not created any positive outcomes for patients. But those, um, I wouldn't say that quite as bluntly. I do have a slightly more political side to make. But but that's that's the, that's the reality is that, you know, how how good are PDRs and clinical supervision if we're not actually challenging individuals around their role and what to do? Um, and I totally agree with the point about we have to learn to speak another language. Um, we've deliberately adopted the terms long-term conditions in Coventry because that's really well understood. So the pathway for um, heart failure is really well understood by every partner um, in health and social care. Um, but what they don't understand is the implications of heart disease with lower limb wounds. Um, so it's linking those things in and saying, right, OK, you're doing a pathway around diabetes care. Um, and you've talked all about, um, you know, um, the importance of checking feet and um, health promotion. 
but what you've not talked about is the the self management sides um, of that or the other aspects um, in terms of what's important for somebody and how to do it. Um, it really interesting conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Just to, uh, come back on that. Sorry. One thing that we often forget is middle management. Uh, middle management are notoriously difficult to um, effect change because, you know, whenever you talk about this, the people on the ground get it and the people properly in charge execs get it, but the people in the middle who have to actually do the change and given no resource to, to be able to make that change, they don't really have the skill set to be able to do it. That's where the real difficulty is. And you know what? And our team kind of goes in and does some of that work for them. And I think that's some of the difference. And we had to get some funding to be able uh, uh, to do that. And then you build up the experience with that. So I think um, you're right. Uh, going to the manager and say, listen, what are your results? And I had to speak, I've had multiple conversations you know, that, that Helen has had where you say, okay, what are your three month results? Uh, when, when it comes to wound healing and you know somebody's been in charge of a service for 10 years doesn't know you think hey what kind of a service are you running here okay, how many also do you have any books i don't know it's like all right well. so then what we did is that we had to go two three steps higher speak to the commissioners and say listen this is what's going on and then it becomes their responsibility around inequality and data and then they sort of kick down as it were um and so there is always a way uh, and you know the good thing about PPP and 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 forums like this is that it raises awareness at a sort of more national level that gets to people, uh, you know, the same message through a different route. Great, thank you very much. I think it would be a little bit of a remiss of me if I didn't speak a little bit about the med tech industry's role that they have to play here. Um, particularly with me working in industry for my, my entire career. Um, I think industry is part of the solution. It needs to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Wound dressings, for example, are very profitable, but never as a wound, he wound dressing ever healed a wound. And medtech can really produce the enabling technologies that we spoke about today that can really go beyond the clinical need of the wound and into helping those they help deliver that wound care to have wider access to the knowledge, to implement that knowledge as we've heard, support the correct clinical decision making, but also improve that clinician's workflow, you know, removing those many areas of redundancy. We've heard a lot about repeat work and incorrect decision making today. I think industry needs to go beyond products and boxes and, and it needs to take more of a service mindset. Um, we need to become a partner to healthcare rather than a pure supplier. The medtech industry sits in a, a relatively unique position. It can take a holistic view of wound care. We get to see and interact with all the stakeholders that you've all mentioned this evening. Um, and I think it's particularly important that we champion those such as patients and those that care for them who don't have as loud a voice. But ultimately, the really the change in wound care uh, for the better is going to have to come with how healthcare systems deliver wound care as well. Mm -hmm. You've heard some great examples of clinical care, education, personalized approaches, but it's also about how we commission care. And, you know, right now we very much work on a fee-for-service model and, and that's a challenge. Um, we really want the wounds to actually heal. Um, we want to move towards a more fee-for-outcome model. But I think it, it taking into account those important comments that not every wound can be healed. Some patients are going to have to live with wounds, but how can we make them live with wounds where they have an improved quality of life? And how do you take that into account? What are the metrics we're giving um, into the wound healing area? The NHS is openly adopting a value-based healthcare approach, but I think it's still very much in the future. And as Naz said, it's very much about getting the right product for the right patient at the right time. But change takes time. Uh, there is always resistance and agility in the new approaches. We've talked about that si siloed working. As Helen said, you know, 10 years of, of working in a siloed way, why change it now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why do anything different? Um, so I think we need to move away from what you hear in those individual episodes of care and really, really on to talking about that total care journey. And we've had some great examples of that this evening. Ultimately, one topic we've not really touched on too much is the prevention of wounds. Um, you know, we've heard, we've heard that the wounds recur. How can we improve education, have new technology to monitor patients the better, and a system that really actually supports prevention as much as it does treatment? So I don't know if anyone wants to make any comments on, on the prevention piece.
Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think this 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 is a really important point, and and part of the stuff that we're doing with uh, our, with the whole systems approach is you know reducing the risk factors that lead to chronic disease that lead to ulcers, um, and uh, what we have adopted is something called the three four fifty approach, which is a concept the three lifestyle behaviors contribute to four conditions that lead to over fifty percent of deaths, and it's all common sense. The three lifestyle behaviors are smoking, lack of exercise, and poor diet contribute to four conditions, which is cardiovascular, respiratory, type of diabetes, and cancer. Between them, those four conditions lead to over 50% of deaths. But those three risk factors of uh, smoking, lack of exercise, and poor diet, if you give that one message to the system, that that is what we need to get patients to do and all people to do, um, we can then uh, you know, simplify the, the message. And we're working with, for example, an example we're doing it in Greater Manchester, is working with an organization called GM Active that works across all the gyms across Greater Manchester. So they've got over nearly a hundred gyms and three and a half thousand staff, including multiple um, personal trainers. Why are we not referring our patients to those people? And why are we not getting people earlier in their journey? Because one of the pilot programs working with screening programs, so you can get people who are going through breast screening, aneurysm screening. Why can't you do more with those people? Do a lifestyle check you know, what can we do to improve your health generally? So that in five or 10 years time, you don't, you don't have cardiovascular disease. Why can't we refer you to a gym? That kind of concept of, you know, uh, systematic public health, as opposed to opportunistic where we have now is one of the projects that we are trialing um, across Greater Manchester. So I think prevention is absolutely part of the way the NHS is going. It's part of the DARS report. And as a system, we have to move from cure to prevention. There are really good programs, not just in greater management, but other areas that really do speak to this. Thank you. I think I've got a question for the audience. You know, I'm sat here as an, a representative of the, of the med tech industry, and I talked about how we need to do become more as a partner to you rather than a, than a supply to you. So a question I would ask is, what, what do you expect from the industry leaders? How do you want them to collaborate and support the implementation of best practice? And maybe while some of the audience think about that question, I'll give some examples of some work Moonlick has done to try and support wound care in the UK. So in 2022, in partnership with the Patient Association, we published an in-depth Making Wound Care Work report that really summarised the wound care landscape and it raised a number of questions, many of which you've already heard um, this evening, as we looked into rebuilding the, the wound care services post-pandemic. Since then, we've worked with the healthcare professionals and patients to redevelop really key recommendations to try and improve that quality of care with wounds. And following on the publication of the report, we've consulted wound care nurses and patients about the questions raised in the report and the six recommendations that were made. The overwhelming theme, and you've already heard it, was that there needs to be a renewed focus on the right care at the right time in the right place. As I said, there were six main recommendations that were made from this piece of work. And one was really upskilling the healthcare professional in the wound care world. You've heard about that, the challenges that they, they face, um, the diversity of clinicians and even non-clinicians that are involved in caring for patients with wounds but the disparate knowledge that exists between that group. Um, as part of Moonlicker, we launched a digital education app called Microworld, trying to encourage greater knowledge and awareness at all levels, including for the patients. Um, we also did a survey with patients to really ask them how they felt about their current wound care services. And that has been shown in, a, in a, the speakers have spoken in a previous webinar about the findings from that survey, when which we went on to develop a partnership through a series of magazines for patients, which we could provide in the GP services, leg clubs with tissue viability nurses to really help patients feel that they're not alone and there are areas where they can go for help and greater knowledge and understanding of their wounds. I think all of these initiatives have given an opportunity for Munica to really take the original project from 2022 and keep that conversation going, keeping it front and center and much like we are this evening. I think there'll always be challenges. Um, we've heard much of them in delivering wound care. Staffing wait, staffing's an issue, waiting lists are an issue. But I think that shouldn't ever put us off from finding new ways to engage with patients and carers 
finding new innovations to really free patients and clinicians from what is truly a burden of wounds. Lauren, Helen, Lauren, do you want to go first? Thanks, Emma. I think just seeing from what's wrote in the chat, but there is, um, I think, a common thing sometimes that some areas are quite fearful of working with industry. And um, I mean, personal experience that we've had, we've had some amazing relationships with industry partners. And what we have found is they have a wealth of knowledge and data and support that actually can be provided to NHS services if it's done in the right partnership. And I think some of the experiences that we've had in the past it's very much that if you're not working in partnership with industry then there can be opportunities where um, messaging may be um, not heard in a particular way or it might not be delivered how you you best advised it so I think it's just a, a word of caution on both parts to work in partnership and building that trust with each other absolutely Helen Yeah, so I've, I've um, held other positions outside of wound care, and I have to say, in the subject of tissue viability, the, the, the mm -hmm. reluctance to recognise industry partners as true collaborators is not present in other specialties, and it's much healthier in other specialties. Um, and I think it, that is partly how we grow our new tissue viability nurses um, and how we support people to develop. Um, I think the other point is that we need to recognise that dressings are not a pharmaceutical product, they're a medical device and we shouldn't be using them or using the same um, same basis for efficacy as, as pharmaceutical products do. Um, while ever they're seen um, as part of pharma, then um, unit cost price will continue to be driven by a number of organisations and tissue viability nurses. Um, and rather than focusing on genuine measures of outcome, rather than this product costs 2p cheaper than that product. Mm -hmm. And I think the work that NHS supply chain is doing is absolutely brutal um, to the value added that, that genuine collaboration can bring. Um, the naivety that we shouldn't be looking at products that are researched by industry, um, absolutely ridiculous. The NHS has got no funds to, to be able to fund randomised control trials um, and provide all of the support that industry partners provide. So I think there are a number of individuals that have driven um, that, that um, trying to think of the right word, that reluctance for people to work with industry um, by holding a very, what I would say, academic position of we should be doing our own research. That is not going to happen. It's just not. Um, so we need to, you know, get that, the reality of that. Um, and I think the sooner we can move to direct supply as opposed to um, FP10 reliance, which creates huge, huge delays in the system for patients. Um, all of which then goes into landfill because we can't actually reuse those when they're prescribed for somebody. So I think it, you know, it is that recognition that the industry are genuine collaborators. Um, most indus most industries, there's still a number that that will completely sell on um, unit cost price. And anybody involved in those decisions that's on this call today, please don't make a decision based on two p. You know, two p, five p, thirty p. Who cares? It's about the actual outcome for the patient. You will never see a colorectal surgeon stood in theatre making a decision about which mesh he's going, he or she is going to use on a patient, or which TNO surgeon is going to choose which knee implant based on unit price. They look at outcomes over the period of time. So let's please move to that in wound care. I'll get off my soapbox now, shall I? <laughs> I think that's a great plea, and I, I think you know. You talk very eloquently about really the need for data and data driven decisions. And I think it is difficult. The vast majority, you look at the publications in the wound care space, by far the mass majority are funded by industry, but it remains independent. You know, the, there are many gate posts and checks and balances in place to make sure industry is held to that and is transparent about what it funds and how it funds it. Um, but I absolutely agree. It has to be a partnership. 
um, and generating the data so that you know no one can then go and make those minimal you know price discussions and it's truly based on the data what the data says and, and the full patient journey not those individual episodes of care you can see in the chat there's a there's a lot of, of support for further industry collaboration and and the word sustainability is coming up a lot and i think that's another thing where industry can lead uh moon liquor is in the top one percent of all companies in all industries for sustainability that wasn't the case five years ago so I think the focus um, that we gave to sustainability, but listening to not just the clinicians, but the patients, uh, wound care can generate a lot of waste, as you mentioned, going, a lot of it going into landfill. Um, so I think, you know, again, an area of collaboration, now seeing the NHS adopting clear KPIs around sustainability, how do we help the health system achieve that? And again, coming back to that need for true partnership. So I think a question for the audience, um, you know, how do you see, lost my question. Uh, what specific areas of the wound care sector do you feel are suffering due to a reluctance of collaboration? And again, if, you, if you'd like to comment on that, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. Nick Hex, I think you have your hand raised. Nick, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Sorry. I, yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Right, that's fine. Thanks. Um, yeah, sorry. It was actually about the previous point. Um, that uh, uh, rather than your question, actually, but it was the point about the. Um, not just going for the cheap. Oh, sorry, my cat's appeared. Um, not just going for the cheapest option, um, but actually, you know, the, the one that will have the best outcomes. And actually, I mean, I work as a health economist, and that's that's effectively what health economics is all about. It's not about the cheapest product. And as you, as as the previous speaker said, you know, quite often people will go, "Oh, well, this is this is a few pence cheaper than that one. We'll go with that one." But you really do. I was just going to reiterate um, the point that was made. Just you really do have to think about this patient outcomes because if if you go for the cheaper out option and one in ten of those patients it doesn't work for them and they have to come back in, then actually it's not the cheapest option um, because you're going to actually end up um, re having to to redo um, clinical work or you know. And, and of course those um, those patients are suffering as a result as well. So it was just to really really just I just wanted to um, just add my weight to the, the previous comment about um, not just going for the cheapest option and making sure it's the most cost effective option is really important. That was it. So thank you. Thank you. I think there's a relevant comment, comment here from uh, Joanna Swan. She says, of course, evidence is important, but there does need to be a reality check and a focus on empowering staff to really evaluate what they're doing. Good patient outcome measures need to be a focus. So I think that's a, that's a, a good balancing point. You know, it very much still sits with the expertise of those treating the patients and making sure that they have the right expertise and empowering them to make the decisions, not just... I think I will say something about clinical evidence, you know, in terms of clinical trial evidence, how real world is that? It's a highly selected patient group where you're looking at very specific outcome measures. So I think, again, through partnership and, and really developing real world evidence um, in true patients with true patient settings and looking at all things is key, particularly to address your previous comment, Helen, on, you know, not all wounds will heal and some patients are living with wounds. So evidence around healing rates and healing the wounds is not particularly helpful for that patient set. But Helen, I know you had a comment for Anne. Yeah, Anne, I was just wondering how you're feeling having listened to all of these conversations because fundamentally everything starts and ends with the people who have wounds or are at risk of wounds. So what what do you take away from here or what comments could you share with us that might help us? I, I think sort of um, definitely looking at patient rather than, oh, this is a person with a leg wound, looking at the individual cases and to see what actually would help them rather than the sort of blanket 
care. So yeah, more focused on patient rather than you must do this because this is what we need to do. Um, I think it. I think it's really good. And these sort of forums that you can come and you can sort of feel that you're you're not alone in this. You know, it's it's a massive massive issue or or um, thing for for everybody. Um, and going to be more focused on the patient, I think it's great. It's really good. So I don't know if there's any further questions from the audience. If not, I'll answer a question that's here, which was around industry and um, provider support to trust. Do you then expect products on farmery? No, absolutely not. Um, so in the healthcare compliance world, we are highly regulated about the support industry can give and it is not tied to sales in any shape or form. Um, so there is a lot of rules and regulations in that space. I think from an industry perspective, it's about supporting the right work that we feel can, can move people, um, patients and clinicians further forward. Now, see so you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that, that exact same point. I mean, I've worked with uh, multiple uh, companies who are genuine uh, around improving patient care. Um, and you mentioned in the way uh, you guys can help, which is around you know, giving us experiences of, of other parts of the country and spreading good practice. And, and every single uh, person I've worked with, all the different companies, you know, they're all sort of relationship managers. Uh, they've kept me away from the sales guys or things like that because it's it's not, the driving, but obviously you need to sell stuff, right? And but that that conversation is not had with the frontline commissions, uh, uh, frontline clinicians, and so my personal experience of working with multiple industry is not that at all. Uh, and I know uh, there is, particularly within the within the academic world, you know, uh, they don't want to work in the industry for all the reasons you, know, you don't get your hands dirty. But my personal experience has not been like that at all. They are genuine people, often clinicians that have uh you know gone into uh in, into I'm, I'm trying i'm trying not to say jump ship right but i'm, I'm not <laughs> afraid it's not as bad as jump ship right but they are clinicians who still genuinely care but just want to attack it from a different a different way so i would i would hold hardly i've never come across somebody who is just around selling products and if, any and if we did come across those people we wouldn't work with them because you know it's, it's just not it's just not what uh comes to because you are also you know incredibly highly regulated as well So maybe in the, in the absence of any any questions from the audience, um, then maybe I'll leave the floor open for each to make one final take home comment. And maybe we can do it this way. If there was one thing you could wish for in wound care, what would it be? And I think it would be only right that we start with you, Anne. I think you're on mute, Anne. Um, consistency um, with uh, the healthcare professionals that you you meet, and I think that's that's definitely key to, to people's um, sort of like journey. I think that's really key. Thank you, Helen. And my takeaway would be: don't keep doing what you've always been doing. Think about the community that you're working in and what challenges those individuals have and what is best for them. Thank you. Lauren? I was going to be selfish and say a local digital wound system, but <laughs> I think what I'd like to say is probably just for the people out there that are on this call or others that might be listening, if you are passionate about delivering best practice, please don't drop your standards and continue striving um, to be the best advocate for your patients and your staff. Thank you. Naz? I guess the one thing is, you know, the one thing that is within our gift to control is the way services are set up. Um, and we know what works, which is multidisciplinary care. So I, th I think uh, I've mentioned it before, all we need to do is to level up care to the diabetes standard without compromising diabetes so that everybody has access to multidisciplinary care. Maybe if we do that one thing, uh, that will make a massive difference uh, across the uh, across the country. Thank you very much. Well, a huge thank you to all our speakers. I think you've all spoke eloquently and very passionately about wound care. Um, and it's an area of ongoing debate that I'm sure will continue for some time yet. 
Um, a big thank you to Public Policy Projects for, for hosting this this evening. Um, for anyone who is interested in continuing the conversation, they do have a wound care conference in London on the 2nd of December. It is free to attend for NHS staff, academic researchers and non-for-profits. So please do check out their website and I'm sure they would hope to see you there and continue this conversation. So with that, a big thank you to everyone and we hope you enjoyed the event.